Charles has given Columbus a great deal. He's given everyone a great deal. People who know about fashion know Charles Kleibacher's work. He is a real perfectionist. He's an artist at what he does. He really is an artist. He's seeing it as a total discipline and practice, and he uh, pushes himself in every level of that. Mine has been a work life all my life. And so that whole business of detail is sort of second nature to me. And uh, I would like to think that maybe in the long run it does make a difference. This is what Charles said in regards to his focus and his discipline. So many people think discipline is a burdensome thing, but it becomes less so as time goes on. And it's made me sharpen up. If he had a problem he was trying, trying to solve, a, a construction detail or a design detail, uh, he would work different samples, different e examples, and work them again and again and again until he got it right. He was very much of a perfectionist in that way. And um, like uh, any artist who is really trying to solve a problem, um, he would really work at it and work it through uh, until he got it to his satisfaction. He took pride in being able to produce such beautiful, lovely dresses that were really their works of art. My history goes back a long time about women's clothes from that department store that my family owned in Cullen, Alabama where there was a women's department, a men's department, a feed department, a grocery department. It was a wonderful situation. And I always um, gravitated toward the women's department. And how did all of this come about? My first years had been as a newspaper reporter and an advertising copywriter. I wind up in San Francisco at one stage of the game. And this was when I was still doing advertising copywriting and it was for a specialty store at there, and a good one. And um, Hildegard was at the Mark Hopkins Hotel. Hildegard, in the late 30s, early 40s, had a great radio show. My mother, who was a great fan of this radio program, would say to us, I don't care where you go, go outside, go in another room, Hildegard is on, I want to, I want to listen to it. So I certainly knew that name, Hildegard, for a long time. And I wrote her a letter. And um, she traveled with a big entourage, and I had a station wagon, and I think partly that's why they hired me, actually. And it's kind of funny because he'll, he'll say that he was very, very shy, hardly would open his mouth, and that was one of the things maybe Hildegard liked about him because he was quiet. <laughs> And after a big tour in this country, we go to Paris. Part of Hildegard's act was really the great clothes and the way she wore them. And she was buying at Dior and Briere and Balmain. And of course, I was very welcome to those shows, she being a rather good customer. And I sat in that salon at Dior one day and I thought, what am I doing? This is what I really always wanted to do. When I went into it in New York, I had had some background now because then I sailed for Europe in 1954 and worked with Castillo at Longvin and worked there for several years in Europe. So that when I came back, I had an idea of what bias cut was all about. Let me show you how I would make Kleibecker designs come to life during the 26 years I had my studio in New York City, I would first research the fabric. I would take a beautiful piece of silk in my hands to feel the richness of the folds on the straight grain. I would then feel them on the cross grain. I would always test, test that wonderful stretch of bias when working with wovens. It, worked then that when I, when I went into the Kleibecker studio, into my own, and was able to analyze it, 
And actually, that was the little niche that we found because mine was a small business. It was up to me to do the money. So the bias cut was really what kind of got us going finally. In the workroom, the sample hands would cut off small pieces on straight grain, on cross grain, machine stitch them, press them, Whichever stitched better, pressed better, was a good part of the answer as to whether to place the pattern on straight grain or on cross grain. With the fabric in mind, I would take cotton muslin and begin to drape, letting the ideas begin to gel on a size eight or a size six dress form. Always doing that wonderful stretch of the bias, which I feel really delineates female anatomy. Charles was, had a studio and he was making clothes for women that were being made in, this, in the way a couture house would make them. He was not making millions of dresses, but what he was making was perfect. The period when Charles was doing a lot of his work uh, selling his designs to Bergdorf Goodman's or Henry Bendel's, his bread and butter was the day wear dress. I can remember when I was first ready to show some garments that I called Bergdorf Goodman and they said, who? Never heard of you. Dresses? Last thing in the world we need. But I was persistent about it and I finally said, why don't you let me come down with some of the garments and a couple of models, you know, live models, and let you see these clothes and see if they might possibly mean something. Well, that was really the beginning because they took a few things and they sold and they reordered. If that happens, then you're, no matter how small a business you are, you're really in business. I'm holding in my hand this issue of the Harper's Bazaar because if one turned the page immediately, uh, was seen a full page ad from uh, Bergdorf Goodman of two of my silk crepe dresses. The superb silk crepes of Charles Klebeck are exclusive in Plaza Collections fourth floor. This is the sort of thing, when Bergdorf Goodman started giving us windows and such an ad as this is when the clothes really did move and when we always managed to get reorders from them. Now, Henry Bendel was the place in 1962, so I went to work there. Bendel's was after new talent. We went to visit Charles Kleibacher and look at his collection. The clothes were beyond magnificent. These dresses were all about the feminine figure, and you wore the dress. It moved with you wherever you went because it was all so carefully cut on the bias. It was like wearing nothing. You know, we, we don't see so much of that in exhibition or holding things up on a hanger. You don't see the movement of the garment itself. But if you think of someone walking on it, just the, the presence of that garment and how it flows in a skirt going on the runway um, is just something that's a very attractive uh, motion that uh, nice thing to see. He um, prides himself on, on the ability to use fabrics that are much more difficult and slippery and um, hard to control. Um, but in addition to that, he sets up another level of challenge that not only does he work with difficult fabrics and difficult cuts, he puts them together in really challenging combinations of color. Many of the garments that I made uh, were in black because there's something about black that, that does appeal to me for a woman. First of all, if she goes to a party, very often she's coming into a room where there are draperies and there are pillows and there are rugs that are patterned. In situations like that, I think black is, is wonderful. I like to see you ladies in black. But when it came to doing color, then is where I felt that um, we could really get dramatic. There is a certain subtlety to color also that I liked very much, and that could mean more of a pale, say, 
but a very unusual kind of a green, or maybe a very unusual kind of a brown. And that's where I think this piece of fabric with that lavender and that brown had a definite appeal to me.